Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 223. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, the man himself, he's back, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning, subscribers and listeners. Boy, do we have an action-packed show that's not only introducing a brand new individual and book and framework of thinking, but also, Mike, kicking off a brand new series for us. I love starting a brand new series. I'm always like, what am I going to learn this series? What can I, what habits can I start? Um, maybe what habits I can stop. And I think that is very appropriate for the first show in this uh, good thinking series, Mark. That's right, Mike. We are kicking off a brand new series on good thinking based on the success as well as the uh, interesting ideas that we found on a few of the shows previously with regards to either physical uh, approaches to uh, mental well-being, but also different practices we can imagine in our minds. But Mike, today we're kicking off with an absolutely action-packed book from Michael A. Singer, The Untethered Soul, The Journey Beyond Yourself. And Mike, this is a pretty popular best-selling book from Michael A. Singer. He's not only released The Untethered Soul, but he's also gone on to write a handful of others following that. So maybe between you and me, there's an opportunity for us to come back to Michael A. Singer in the future. But today, listeners, we're digging into The Untethered Soul, which could be arguably his most uh, well-known book because he's appeared on a number of different individuals promoting it, Mike. I would say we need to imagine that David Goggins and Brené Brown met in a bar. They had a a child and Michael (laughs) Singer is the product because he really does have this amazing collection of work, which is really about to transform how we think, how we feel about things and how we respond to them. And these are massive moonshots themes. We might not be in control of everything in the world, but we're certainly in control of how we choose to respond to them. And we have so much to dig into. So if you're interested in not letting your emotions get the better of you, understanding a more even balanced path, or frankly, you just like don't want to go to 10 straight away when things don't quite work your way. This is the show for you. Some might say it's a bit of a thorny issue, but I believe that's a great place to start, don't you, Matt? Yeah, I think, Mike, we should pull out any of the discomforts that we might have by digging in straight away into Michael A. Singer's book, The Untethered Soul, with a key, a, a very a substantial and clear insight all around removing your inner thorn. My other favorite chapter of my new favorite book, uh, The Untethered Soul, is removing your inner thorn. We all have them, right? Yes, we do. Do you still have some thorns? Of course. You do? Okay. The spiritual journey is about constant transformation. So you were saying, imagine, can you just do this for our audience, that whole passage on imagining you have a thorn uh, in your arm that directly touches a nerve. Can you right. do that? So oh. the analogy we were using is if you had a thorn that was touching directly to a nerve so much so that anything that touched it caused pain inside of you. So if you walked, just go to walk through the woods and the leaf touched it, you weren't able to walk. If you were uh, trying to interact with people, it caused a disturbance. And the key point of it is you have two choices. One is You can either try to avoid everything in your life that touches that thorn, or you can do this amazing alternative, which is take it out, (laughs) all right? If you try to avoid it, you will be avoiding it for your entire life. It will go on constantly. Which is what we're all doing, right? Yes, it is. We're all doing. We we got our thorns in, and we don't want anybody to touch them. And if they touch them and they irritate our little thorn, we're upset because you shouldn't have touched my thorn. Yes. That's the whole. And that's the game that we play is how do I build a life that avoids touching all this stuff that happened to me that I can't handle? When they happened, I couldn't handle it. And now it's caused all these soft spots inside of me. Thorns. Thorns. So I need to create a life train everybody around me, right? So they don't Avoid ever touch my that. Thorn. Uh, you don't touch- Some people even say that. Don't you go there That's with right. me. That's yeah, right. yeah, exactly yeah. Right. right. The alternative is to understand you can remove that thorn inside of you the same as you can remove it outside. And if you remove it, you will never have to think about it again. And you can start to enjoy your entire life. And that is spirituality. How, that is spirituality. Now, how do, you, how do you know what your thorn is? Disturbance tells you. Just like pain happens when you hit the thorn outside, disturbance happens inside. Because it's never what 
is actually happening. Right. It's what is happening is irritating yes. your thorn. It was put Ooh. in there before. That's, That's good. very good. That's, That's very good. good. That's, That's good. good. So those events will show That's you. That's good. Y'all get that? That's really good. So even when you see your husband leaves the, you know, drawers open yes. or the whatever open yes, or the yes, left yes, something, yes. it's not about what's going on. Right. It's about the thorn yes. that was there. Yes. So, okay, how do we then begin to remove the thorns? That's right. the spiritual journey, right. is it not? Yes, it is. When something hits it, you will feel a disturbance pop up inside of you, right? And you have to choose right then, what are you going to do about that? Okay, so, and by something hitting it mean, meaning you're in a conversation, you're in your office, somebody says something, it hits a nerve, you think they have disrespected yes, you, whatever. they have stepped out of bounds, they shouldn't have said that, your boss did something, your child did something. That's the nerve. But what's the difference between that and they really did do something? The difference is you always start with saying, do I want to be disturbed? Do I like being disturbed? No, I don't like being disturbed. So I have a choice. An event happened outside. I can deal with that event without being disturbed. In fact, I can promise you I can deal with it better without being disturbed. Disturbance isn't helping you. Disturbance is hurting you. Got it. And so you are way better off learning how to deal with the disturbance. And that is also how you remove the thorn. They are directly related. The fact that the situation outside stimulated this disturbance inside of you means that you've uncovered something stored inside of you that needs to come out. That's interesting. I think, Mark, the argument that Singh is making there is something might trigger us to get frustrated, angry, anxious, stressed, or upset. But what he's saying, there's there's something behind that. You know, Oprah was riffing about not closing the socks drawer. <laughs> you got to <laughs> love Oprah. She's yeah. like this mega successful billionaire entrepreneur and she can still complain about the sock drawer being <laughs> left open. <laughs> but what I think the learning for us in this is, and I'm sort of unpacking this in real time, is like we can get all caught up by surface level things but what Singh is asking us to do is go a level deeper and say, well, why did that bother you so much? And what's the real thorn that's annoying you and causing you that uh, upset? Because he, he says, until you get to that, you're not really dealing with the fundamental thing that's causing the emotional response. Pretty powerful, right? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I think the way I can try and build on that is how he has illustrated this idea is is quite a new one to me. I think he's calling out the fact that it's very, very easy for us all to avoid dealing with the thing that causes a lot of pain. Mm. In this case, he's obviously calling uh, calling out a thorn in our side. And he's calling out specifically that it would, wouldn't it just be simpler in the long run to deal with that thorn, to take it out, maybe de- maybe stitch it up, maybe put it to one side, move on and so on rather than just putting a bandage on it every single time or maybe trying to ignore it. For me, it's really a a story that can break down a short-term reaction to something, a behavior of ours perhaps that we've Mm. uh, always had, certainly something that I would do. If there's something that is causing great discomfort, yeah, I might try and deal with it later because- Mm. At the, at the same, as we all know, there's never a good time to deal with problems, is there? <laughs> Isn't that true though? But Mike, just <laughs> let's capture that for a moment. How many times do we find ourselves going, oh, that really frustrates me, mm. but we, we, we don't deal with it. Why do you think we avoid, do you think it just, we sense that it might be uncomfortable, challenging, might be a bit upsetting to really get after it? Do you mm. think that's what it is? Yeah, I think I think there's there's two ways or two reactions that I think come to mind. One is, uh, I I don't really have time for this right now, so I'll deprioritize it. Mm. Maybe it's there's a very important project or a very in, uh, important situation that's happening, and you don't really want to have to deal with it because there's something else that you've got to do with it first. But also, and- Mark, you and I both know. You're also, when you say there's not enough time, you're also choosing not to make time, right? It's that deprioritization, isn't it? Which then builds onto the second one, which is the avoidance angle. Oh, I want to avoid dealing with this problem because I fear it. 
I'm yes. scared of having to yes. confront this situation head on. What happens if I pull the needle out and it hurts even more? Right. Or what happens if uh, I pull it out and suddenly things get worse? So I'm going to deprioritize it and leave it alone when really, as Singer's calling out, that's just a way of delaying perhaps the inevitable or if not delaying it, you're leaving it to cause even more pain in the long run. Yeah. And I, I think about it a bit like physical discomfort. Like mm. if I've got a sore back, you know, my first response is, oh, that hurts. But it's all about being able to grab the roller or the yoga mat and stretch it out and and deal with it because like chronic physical pain really takes its toll as does emotional pain. And, um, what's so great is we are about to dive into a book and a piece of work and thinking, uh, from Michael A. Singer that is all about getting into this and tackling this. And on the other side of that, I think there's all sorts of, I think your day can just be better. So I'm really excited to jump into all of that. What I'm also excited to do, Mark, is to bring to your attention and to all our listeners and members that we have a couple of our members have uh, had their annual, their their one-year anniversary with us. We have new members as well. Um, So, Mark, I think it is only appropriate that you cue the brass band, the trumpets, the horns, and that we usher in um, our and acknowledge our members and listeners. Please welcome all of our untethered souls who are here with us, learning out loud each and every week and joining us on the Moonshots journey. Bob, Johnny, John, Terry, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour and Paul, Berg, Kalman, David, Joe, Crystal, Ivo, Christian, Samuela, Barbara and Andre, all of whom have been with us for well over a year, Mike, as, as extra special. <laughs> for all of those individuals. But also hot on those heels are Eric, Chris, Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig, Daniel, and Andre, Ravi, Yvette, Karen, Raul, PJ, Nikowada, Ola, Ingram, Dirk, and Emily, Harry, Karthik, Venkata, Marco, Roger, Steph, Gabia, Anna, Raw, Nimalen, Eric, and Diana, Wade, Amanda, Christoph, Denise, Teresa, Bolarinwa, and our brand new members, Smitty and Laura. Welcome to the Moonshots Rocket, where we're all learning out loud together every single week. Thank you so much for your contribution and your membership. Um, Much appreciated here at the Moonshots headquarters at the uh, launch pad for Moonshots. And I think it's only appropriate that we kind of launch in now to the answer to this question that we were talking about, which is, if you sense that there is some emotional disquiet, if you've got an inner thorn, the real thing that Michael A. Singer does is he presents a solution to that. And I think it's only appropriate now that we jump into this idea of surrender. Without specifically defining the word, because I am sure by now you understand what's meant by surrender. It doesn't mean you're surrendering to somebody It's not somebody else's will superimposed on top of yours. It doesn't mean you're a weakling. I surrender. I give up. I don't want to fight. It doesn't mean you're surrendering your marriage or marrying. It doesn't mean you're surrendering your job or working. It doesn't mean anything like that. That's why I refuse to define surrender in the beginning. Surrender is very, very subtle and it's very, very powerful. And you will find out that it is the entire spiritual journey. What surrender is, as we've discussed it, is you are in a predicament. It's called reality. Right now, where almost all of us are, I'm leaving the masters out, is we are conscious and we are aware of what is unfolding in front of us. The world is coming in, we're experiencing it. The mind is reacting to the world that's coming in because we stored reactive triggers inside ourselves due to our past experiences. The heart is reacting to the reaction of the mind, or we have stored so much within our heart that it's leaking. It just comes up with stuff all by itself. It doesn't need the outside world to come in and stimulate. This is reality. This is what's going on. 
So you are in there overwhelmed at all times by this experience of releasing energies inside of you that most people know absolutely nothing about. And it's like a drowning person. I'm drowning. Well, while I'm drowning, I'm not very nice. While I'm drowning, I scream a little bit. While I'm drowning, I yell at people, help me, help me. I do all kinds of things while I'm drowning. If somebody swims to help me, I'll grab them. They may drown too. I'm not in charge of my actions. I'm not a rational human being. I'm not centered. I'm not clear. I'm drowning. And we are drowning inside. So what do you do when you're drowning? You try to grab something solid. That's what you do. You try to grab a a floating board passing by. You try to grab anything you can in order to not sink. That is how almost everybody is living their lives. Mike, I'm getting two pieces of information from Michael A. Singer in, in that clip. And I think both of them lean towards this idea of forgiveness specifically how to forgive ourselves. Mm. And in doing so, what I think he's calling us out to, without necessarily giving a specific definition of surrender, the way that I'm interpreting it though, is it is slightly different to surrendering to the situation and giving up. Instead, I think the surrender that Singer actually is, is, is calling out here is be aware of the situation that you're in, watch your body's reactions, and th- those that body might be both a mental as and or a physical one, and watch it without judgment. And when you can get to a point of watching that reaction, your body's reaction to say a very stressful situation without judgment, you might then notice that you're feeling overwhelmed and therefore forgive yourself. You might realize actually it's quite reasonable for me to feel overwhelmed at this situation, or it might feel reasonable that it's really uh, causing me discomfort, whatever this thing at hand might be. And in doing so, what you're enabling yourself to consider and almost surrender to is saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable now. I can accept that it's going to be short term, perhaps. I can accept that it's going to change with time. And therefore, I won't necessarily weigh myself down in that situation. Mm. How, what, what are you interpreting in, from, from Singer's point with regards to surrender? So I want to focus on the idea of the forgiveness piece. And I feel like the way I am relating to this is, you know, you need to forgive yourself, but you also need to forgive others because you know, when you meet people that have never really forgiven themselves or other people for some trespass, right? Mm. They carry that with them and it blocks their view of the world. And I've got a little example here. I worked with somebody, super talented person, who'd had um, a really exciting company that they had built uh, and it didn't work out for whatever reason. And myself and a couple of people were with this person in a new company after the first one. So let's call this the second company. And oh my gosh, were we onto something? We were firing on all cylinders and it was a great. But this one person was so hurt from their previous company. And because they hadn't really dealt with that emotion, someone explained to me that they're still fighting the fight from company one, even though they're in company two. So there was some mistrust and insecurities that had really no no reason to be there, but they existed because they had not truly forgiven the people who had been unfair to this person in the the previous company. And so it really hurt the outcome in this new company, which was doing great, like really great. Mm. Um, And it just got, you know, all choked up. And uh, it was the absence of the forgiveness. Because I don't think until you forgive yourself for all the stupid things that we do, for all the silly things that we say, for all the mistakes we unknowingly make until you just accept them, forgive them and move. You, you just can't move on, can you? You just no. can't because you're always taken back. I, I think of this as dwelling in the yep. past. And I think the way to stop dwelling and dwelling feels a little bit captured to me. You know what I mean? You keep going back to like, like I had these uh, traumatic events Um like, you know, when I was, uh, when I was at high school, I got, had a really 
disappointing uh, experience when I got dropped from a from a sports team, and it was really hurtful. But you got to move on. Like mm. you got to accept that you're upset and you were disappointed. You've got to forgive yourself for not working hard enough. Forgive those that booted you off the team in order to move forward. Because if you can't do that forgiveness, which requires the acceptance of that there's something that needs to be forgiven, you, I find that you're always taken back to that thing and you're caught up and you almost re- keep re-experiencing mm. the trespass, right? Yeah. And if, if you're beating yourself up, Mark, about something that you've done and you never forgive yourself, well, then you're almost reliving it. It's like inception. You just keep reliving it. Well, and, and I think if you're, if you're reliving it, what, what's most likely going to happen is you will relive it. You know, it's possible that you'll then cause you'll that reproduce same. it. Correct. Exactly. And ultimately, I think this is the thorn perhaps that Michael A. Singh is calling out here, isn't it? The thorn can be something that somebody has done to us. It can be something uh, uncaused by us, or it can be something that we did ourselves and are refusing to move on from. And in doing so, it's possible that you're then going to recreate it again. Oh, and I yes. think you're totally right. Unless you can come, uh, c- go head on and enter the arena, perhaps, as Brené Brown would say, with this thorn and take it out and, and deal with it, you're only ever going to carry it as unnecessary baggage, so, which is going to weigh down and possibly influence negatively future situations. So, Mike, check this out. If, if Brene Brown, you know, in her warm tone of voice, invites us to step into the arena, how many expletives would uh, David Goggins require to get us into the arena? <laughs> you have get in the F and you F and? Yeah, um, exactly. I think it's a similar thing, isn't it? I think he- end, yes. He's he's calling us out uh, very similarly in his most recent book, the idea of uh, not getting too complacent. That's right. You know, I, th- I think thorns can be in a number of very very different substantial ways. One can mm. be very very negative. Another one can be something much more subtle. Mm. So, like you just said, Mike, with David Goggins, he might come at things with a lot of energy, and what he then notices is when he takes his foot off the gas a little bit and slows down that energy. Uh, expelling, <laughs> we, I guess we could say, he then starts to take it a little bit easier, which is not necessarily something that he would normally have gone for. Yeah. So let's frame this because what we're learning from Michael A. Singer and his book, The Untethered Soul, is you need to acknowledge that we're all carrying around some thorns, right? And they cause us some discomfort. And once we've acknowledged that they exist, we need to surrender ourselves and get to that cause, not the Mm. symptoms, but the cause through this art of forgiveness and surrender. At which point we are now brought to some whole new thinking from Michael Singer. A lot of his work talks about paths and choices, but we can only talk about those if we've done the work on the forgiveness and the surrender and acknowledging that the thorns exist in the first place. So now what we're going to do is through Clark Kegley, a great little YouTuber, we're going to get into this left hand, right hand turn that we can all make. And the frame for this is all about path one and two. So of course, we're going to start with path one. The way I see it, there's two possible outcomes to this. Okay, there's two possible paths that you could go down after hearing this. And the first one, it's not good. The second one, probably what you want. Let's talk about the default way. This is how most people live their lives. They say that at any given time, we can step forward into growth or fall back into safety. So most people, they're living the same scripts or running the same stories in their mind. They program it into certain ways. The default, it's fear. This is the safety, the fear. This is where most people are stuck just in survival. You know, it's not their fault. I mean, if you look at biology, 60,000 thoughts a day, it's estimated you have 80%, depending on which uh, studies you're looking at, are the same as the day before negative thoughts, automatic negative thoughts or ants. So you've got these automatic negative thoughts running the scripts, running the programs in your life. How the heck are you supposed to be positive? Of course, that inner roommate succeeds and beats you up and says all this stuff to you, right? You're no good. You're this, you're this. If you just let it keep going by default, 
it's not very good. Layer that on top of one of our cognitive biases that we have, it's called a negativity sway bias. So if presented two things, right, a positive news story or a negative news story, the human mind gradually gravitates towards the negative thing because it's more important to see what's going to kill you or what has a danger, right, per, primed for survival in our head than what could make you happy and put a smile on your face. That's just how we're wired. I mean, I look, without getting too deep here, if it bleeds, it leads. That's how the media is running everything, right? That's how they like get the viewership. They get the negativity there. Even on YouTube, videos talking about negativity stuff, right? Those get insane amounts of views because that's kind of like the modern day tabloids. It's like people stopped following celebrities and they started following social media influencers, right? So of course, who wouldn't want the dirty gossip on some of them, right? Those get so many more views than like the positive stuff. And this goes to a larger conversation of the global consciousness of our planet and maybe how it hasn't risen on the vibrational chart towards beyond fear or beyond, um, you know, those lower vibrational states. So that's naturally what we are inclined to, right? But as we start lifting it up together and it starts with you, and I think that you watching this right now are proving that you're not in that camp, you're a higher vibration than the majority, right? Then it starts to lift everyone else up. How do you do this? How do you tap into this second way? Okay, and to summarize, right, this voice in your head that's negative, it'll constantly go to the default first mode, which is living out of fear. That's the entire state of our global consciousness right now. Look at 2020, right? Doom and gloom all over, right? You look beneath the surface, story looked a lot different than what they were projecting on, right? But you can tell a narrative one way and people pick it up and they're like, oh, that's what's happening, right? But under the surface, if you look at the alternative, it's like, oh, is that really happening? You're questioning it, right? Getting trapped in this fear state, this doom and gloom. This is the default. This is scary. And this is why that roommate takes over and is such a bastard to you. Okay, Mike, we've got quite a lot of ideas within that clip from Clark Kegley. Mm. That we, I think we should start to break down. And I think the first one is what Clark's uh, referring to from Michael A. Singer, which is our default way of living. And that is one out of fear. And do you know why? Do you know genetically, do you know why we do that? Do you think it's down to the, that fight or flight response that we've spoken about before? Yeah. And go deeper. Why does that exist? It's, it's desire to survive. Isn't exactly. It? This is the huge, uh-huh. So this is something we've learned a lot from Goggins and other folks is that when we're in discomfort, it often triggers fight or flight Cause the body's like, Hey, I'm sensing this ain't good. So I'm going to like ignite all these warnings. And so for example, how many times do we hear of athletes pushing through barriers that like the, the four minute mile was considered unbreakable mm -hmm. and now it happens all the time. People learnt and trained, but part of that process it's so Joe Rogan getting comfortable with the discomfort. Like if you're going to run longer and faster, you can say to yourself, I know I'm going to feel like quitting at kilometer 15 mm. because I'm pushing harder and I'm running longer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare myself for that feeling, but I'm not going to accept it. How many times do we hear from athletes or from entrepreneurs that people have no idea of their potential because they – they listen too keenly to the fight or flight, to the fear yeah. factor, right? Yeah. Can you, I mean, can you imagine how many individuals that we've studied on the Moonshot Show that have come close to quitting or maybe even been rejected by other individuals? Mm -hmm. Obviously, Oprah is one that we refer to a lot. Yeah. Said that they didn't, uh, she didn't have the energy or the character to be on television, but they refused to listen. And they Correct. decided to push back. And I think, Mike, this might come exactly as you were saying from that um, energy of Joe Rogan, the uh, perhaps the courage seen from somebody like David Goggins. And it really is down to that growth mindset, isn't it? It really is. Like you got to do the work, like to use a sports analogy, like you can't just go out and run a marathon unprepared. Mm. But I mean, so so let me do it this way. You can't just go and run a marathon without any training. You've got to put in the work. You've got to build up the muscle strength, the cardio. You've got to learn how to fuel yourself. But at some point, in 
like what do they say the difference is between the world champs and the rest in pro sports? Mindset, because they will not give up. Kobe, Jordan, they just refused to give up. They were able to go through thresholds. Like Goggin says, like, look, you know, most people don't even get to half of their potential, right? They don't even push themselves. If you push yourself mentally and emotionally, just like you would physically, to go and deal with the thorn, surrender yourself, but also I think this is the big one. When you, let's go super practical, uh, negative self-talk, you can just say, today I refuse to allow any negative monkey mind business. I'm not going to have it. You might even say, as soon as I go to start thinking something negative, I'm going to immediately turn it to a positive, right? If you get to this point through the work of Michael Singer and many of the other people that we've studied in Moonshots, where you realize, oh, I don't have to indulge negativity, fear, and the monkey mind. In fact, it is my choice. As a man thinketh, very famous book by James Allen, Uh, think and grow rich. Mm. If you think about all the great self-transformation works, they come down to the choice at this crossroads that Michael Singer is presenting to us. Do we go to the path of fear and avoid, or do we go through those obstacles? Mm. Do we embrace and do we enjoy? Like maybe we don't get it right the first, second or the 10th or the thousandth time. Maybe like Thomas Edison, it took us 10,000 goes at the light bulb, but holy smoke, Mark, where would Mm. we be without the light bulb? (laughs) And it reminds me again of uh, Daniel Pink, the power of regret. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, studies that he did. And when we dove into that book, that people don't necessarily regret the things that they did try. It's the things that they didn't. Exactly. I think this again speaks to this uh, this concept of taking a, an old cliche, taking the bull by the horns, or specifically trying to think better and refusing that monkey mind mm. to make the choice for us. Instead, if we can take that back and choose that uh, first path and avoid, uh, or sorry, to avoid the first path and this root of fear, and instead start to lean towards this second path that we're going to hear from Clark Hegley in the next clip breakdown is how we can continue keeping that roommate, which we heard from Michael A. Singer on our side, and instead think about version 2.0. Yeah. So the way we do that before we go there, and I'm dying to press play on the clip, Mark, (laughs) (laughs) but I think like the greatest gift we can give to all our members and listeners right now is when they have that next negative thought, if they know they don't have to have that thought, they can choose to make that a positive thought. Mm. If they want to get really upset about something somebody else did, that is a choice. They don't have to get upset. They could defer judgment, become objective, maybe detach a little bit, just accept, yeah, this is frustrating, but hey, I'm, if I give in to that fear, I'm going to waste a whole lot of my energy getting upset and it's going to get me absolutely nowhere. And we also know people make terrible decisions when they're all upset anyway. So mm-hmm. frankly, it's a step backwards. Yeah. You just, if you know that, that that moment is a choice. So if you want to feel like a victim in the world, it's against you and it's this and them and it's so very bad and everybody, that's a choice. And so is being great, like Oprah. So is being great, like Walt Disney, Einstein, Steve Jobs. All of these people faced massive challenge in their life and did not let it get the better of them. It's a choice. Mm. This is the greatest moment of self-transformation. If you say, ah, I suck, the world sucks, that's a choice to think that way. And what we're clearly seeing is that there's another path and Michael A. Singer calls it path two. So what's the solution? The second solution is right here. This is what we'll talk about is remember and step forward into growth, fall back into safety. This is stepping forward into growth. You can come out of fear or you can come out of love. 
This is how you raise yourself up and in turn raise the whole consciousness of the planet up, get that roommate on your side, get everything you want. This is the authentic you, what I call a 2.0 version of yourself and you start living from here. Now, a quick story on this. Let's look at the author of this book, right? Who talks about this, like being authentic is the highest thing to raise your vibe because you're true to yourself, right? And sometimes that roommate's kicking on for a reason. It's like, hey buddy, this isn't you, this isn't you. Not your vibe, not your thing, right? Change it up a bit. And that's a good way that it kind of is like a coach, coaching you there. Speaking of authentic, let's look at this. Michael Singer, guy who wrote the book. You'd expect this guy to be like some monk, uh, sitting in the Himalayas, wearing robes, super spiritual dude in Whole Foods every day, right? But I love his story because it's not that at all. He was super successful studying a doctorate in economics. I think it had he had a breakup or something that led him to meditate in the woods, right? Um, and kind of come to some of these realizations. But he started WebMD, okay? The company that if you've ever in the middle of the night gotten a headache, you're like, what is this? You went to Google and you Googled your symptoms and then you found out you had, you were pregnant while you were a man and you had like 50 other things, right? And you're just freaking inside. You got him to think. My point there is that so many times in the spiritual community, I think, or self-development community, we can get caught up on a certain way of being that, oh, that's the most spiritual path. And so we actually abandon our own wants, needs, feelings, desires. But that's actually wrong, quote unquote, to try and conform to what we think is spiritual out here. It's more authentic to be the best version of you, to tap into who you really are, right? That's why I love that story right there and that example. You know, what you're watching right now, there's some people out there who leave comments all the time like, oh, this guy is, you know, he's a bro and he's explaining these deep spiritual topics like a chakra. It's actually pronounced chakra. And, you know, if you, you should respect it. And I'm just like, to each their own, right? You meet me on the street, I'm just like this. You know, you can be spiritual and still suck down a 20-wing combo at Buffalo Wild Wings, let me tell you. And you're more happy when you're in tune with that and you're authentic with it. This is what I call a 2.0 version of you. I literally walk people through. I've been obsessed with this process because I think it's your identity layer, the deepest one, beyond just the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the stories, is your identity at the core. The layer of the onion. The deeper you go the more effective it is, right? And then the other ones kind of knock over. Once you get that identity piece right, you create the 2.0 version of yourself. Mike, this idea of authenticity, it's, it's been such a considerate one that I keep on finding we run into on the, mm. this moonshot's journey, isn't it? This, In fact, as Clark Headley calls out in that clip, the task of becoming the best version of ourself is only accessible through authenticity. You can't be the best version of somebody else. Right. Well, think how hard it is trying to pretend to be someone else that you're yeah. not. Like that's man, that's hard work. You can't exactly. keep it up for too long. <laughs> well, and 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 this idea really speaks to, I think, the work of Elizabeth Gilbert. Mm. And that idea of Great creativity. Call. It's Great again call. giving you know, someone else we've got to give a tip of the hat to is Carol Dweck as well. I think we've got to spend some time here. I mean, but continue with Elizabeth and then we'll do Carol. Well, I, I think there's there's a huge learning that Elizabeth Gilbert had built from Carol Dweck, actually. Mm. This idea of um, forgiveness, perhaps, if you want to give it that sort of title that Elizabeth Gilbert leans into, is this idea that it's okay to either A, struggle, but also B, take a little bit of time to find that, that direction of yours. Because even though somebody else may have got to a destination quicker than you, it's inauthentically not your journey. Instead, the journey that you're going on, no matter how long it takes, no matter how much work you've got to put into it, is authentically yours. And I mm. think this idea of getting through it and creating whatever that piece of work might be, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's a bit of design, maybe it's a product or a service, whatever it might be, or maybe it's just an authentic behavior that you put into the world, whatever it might be, that is very, very authentic to yourself only. And I think only that's accessible once you've accepted or celebrate that Carol Dweck approach, which is that growth mindset, don't you think? Yeah, we're getting super schooled here by Michael A. Singer, I think. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I would say that if you're open and not closed, if you choose love over fear, if you choose to be yourself and not somebody else, good things happen. I mean, Elizabeth Gilbert said, you know, maybe that story has been told many times, but not 
by you. Mm. And I think that's a great way to think about creativity and life overall. Um, you know, the, the thing I'm walking away with here is it sounds almost so common sense, but I think what people like Eckhart Tolle, um, people like Brené Brown do is they give us reminders, roadmaps, inspiration templates to declutter our brain so we can spend more time on who we really are and get out of the monkey mind. I think I really do think that's the, the, you know some of the biggest battle that we all face. I think that that it's all about celebrating what happens when we do that. When you clear your head, when you feel good in yourself, that is the the catapult and the launch pad to do good things. Mm. Like consider the difference. Let's say you had to write a five pager, and you feel tired, busy, stressed. Can you imagine how hard it is to do that? Or if you've had a good sleep, you're in control of things, you've cleared your mind, and then you set about doing it. Mm. It's going to come so much easier. And I think it goes for all things in life. If we choose the right path, if we remove the thorns with the process that we've been given by Michael Asinger, I I just want to make sure we all remind ourselves of what, what is the opportunity. And if we don't mm. choose this path, what we're giving up, like if you can't be your true self, if you can't really acknowledge all the emotional bumps that you have along the way and move towards being a better version of yourself, it feels like such a compromise, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it feels as though you are always be searching for that next um, piece of betterment, I suppose. I think one of the things that clearly gets called out a lot in our shows and in a lot of the books that we study, Mike, is that it is a journey to go on. And actually, instead of celebrating the final destination, i.e., hey, I've created a great piece of authentic work, or hey, I am the best version of myself, instead it's celebrating that uh, challenging journey that you go on in order to get there, right? Absolutely. Like, Again, the sporting analogy, yeah, it's okay mm. to dream about running the marathon, but you should spend much more time dreaming about yourself pushing through the pain at kilometer 20. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> because cause that's, that's life, Yeah, right? I, I, like it's so funny that even when you're at the top of your game, little things can happen to remind you of how fallible we are and being prepared to push through those periods on the run in life, in your work, where it's not quite going right, but you've got to push through. You've got to really work on it. It is not sufficient to dream of an amazing life. Hmm. Dream of the work you're going to do that is amazing. That may lead also to an amazing life. Like the reordering here, I think is, is really critical. I think in this last clip, what we have is a chance to look at what life looks like when you practice these things, don't you, Matt? Yeah, that's right. I think we've learned already a lot within this show, Mike. We've already delved into the idea of um, noticing and accepting. But actually, this final clip that we're going to hear from with Michael A. Singer breaking down for us is about finding that flow and how to actually flow with, so to speak, those challenging moments in life and ultimately learning how to just let it pass. The technique is as follows. Ready? Your mind is a very great thing. It is brilliant. It took metals and sand and taught the sand to think in silicon and took metals and made a rocket ship, got inside and flew to the moon. (sighs) Oh my God. You are brilliant. (laughs) You have a brilliant mind, okay? That's not the problem. The problem is what you're doing with it. When you go to that brilliant mind, you say, I'm not okay because I store all this junk inside of me. Figure out how everybody else needs to be so I can be okay. That is a total misuse of mind. Stop it. That's what you do. (laughs) That's That's your technique. Stop doing that. Don't use your mind for that. That's the personal mind. Don't use your mind for that. Use your mind for great things. Don't use your mind for sick things. Well, but then what do I do about the fact that I'm not okay? Fix it. Don't make everybody else be different so you can be okay. Don't have all these rules of how everything needs to be so you feel better. Find out why you're not okay. How's that? Buddhists say work at the root. That's the root, right? Well, why am I not okay? I told you. You just weren't listening. 
you're not okay because you shoved all this stuff inside of you of every single experience you ever had in your life that bothered you, they weren't comfortable with. There are going to be things that are not comfortable. You see a rattlesnake all coiled up, rattling. Oh, that's not comfortable. I promise you I've seen him. <laughs> all right? That's, that's, that's supposed to scare you. You understand? That's why he's doing it. It's not wrong. It's not bad. It didn't ruin your life. It's a heck of an experience, in fact. Does that mean I should go pick it up? No, you respect the experience you're having, and then you let it pass. You're a greater being because you had that experience. Every experience you have makes you a greater being. Because you had the experience. I don't know how to explain that to you. Why do you practice tennis? Why, why do you, when you practice tennis, do you just have the ball, the you know, ball server, the auto mic server, do you just have it come exactly where your strength is every single time so you can get better at where you're strong? No, you hit it all over the place. Why? Because every single angle you get better because you use those muscles and because you came in tune, right or wrong. Practice makes perfect. Well, if practice makes perfect in sports, why does practice not make perfect in life? Experience is your best teacher. Therefore, every single experience you have, you have it and it passes through you. Don't hold on to the rattlesnake so that you miss the next experiences. Honor and respect the experiences you had. Everyone, the divorce, the this, the children, the child, traumas. I don't care. I'm serious. Stop it. You're not a victim. You're somebody who received the gift of experience. How's that? The fact that it wasn't comfortable, well, the rattlesnake wasn't comfortable. Fine, that's part of the experience. Let it go. I'm glad I had that experience. Now I know better about rattlesnakes. I met one. <laughs> okay? Um, I, I know how to deal with it. Well, okay, fine. You met divorce. Your parents got divorced. Wonderful. You win. The person whose parents didn't get divorced, they lost. They didn't get to have that experience. That's how you have to look at it. Every single experience you have is its weight in gold. It's a gift from God. And it's your gift because nobody else had your experience. So you process these. Let them go. That's your spiritual path. If meditation helps, meditate. If mantra helps, do mantra. But the purpose is not meditation or mantra or any of the techniques. The purpose is, are you willing to stop storing inside of you the things that were difficult when you had the experience? Because otherwise you store difficulty inside of you. It's going to be there all the time. You understand that? If you have a bad smell, don't collect them and take them home so you put them in a room and remember how bad it was and how much you didn't like it. Just let it pass. Oh boy, let it pass. I mean, we can go so many ways with this one, Mark. Um, I heard practice makes perfect. I mean, that's huge. I really heard someone there who was saying, don't hold on to things, right? I heard someone inspiring us in Michael A. Singer, like, let it pass. Just get comfortable with discomfort and yeah, I'm, I'm like, just don't dwell in the past. That, that was so evocative. That story yeah. says it like, you don't collect all the bad smells you smell in life and put them in a room. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't, but I think maybe the uh, thing that you do find with let's, let's use smells is that you constantly refer back to them. Don't you? Whether let's say it's, it can be something like cut mm -hmm. grass. You can then create a memory stack based on that smell. And I think where Michael A. Singer is going here is the fact that every single experience, let's say it is that bad smell, maybe it's something uncomfortable in the short term, but every time you smell it again, you'll be uh, getting more and more strong, more and more layered because you can refer back to more and more experiences perhaps with that moment of, of discomfort or perhaps that thorn that's in your side. So, what a journey that we have been on, Mark. Um, five big ideas from Michael A. Singer. Um, you're fresh back here in Australia. We're fresh on a new series. That's a perfect moment to give you some homework. What is your pick, Mark? I think for me it's, it's this concept that we all have moments or items within our lives that could perhaps be thorns in our sides. Maybe those are physical, maybe those are mental. And I love the idea that Michael A. Singh is bringing to us within this brand new series, which is attack it head on, deal with it, mm. don't delay, mm. don't put it on to, to somebody else's to-do list because it's only you who can go out and access it and try and pull it out. What about you, Mike? What's standing out to you from this brand new journey? Uh, look, I, I got to go back to school. It's the surrender and the forgiveness. You know, that's mm. that seems to be pretty crucial. If you want to pick a path, you just have to, you know, fully acknowledge, appreciate, and then get the hell on with things. Like, yeah. 
this not dwelling is really huge I for me. So. Well, Mark, I want to say thank you to you as you are back on our fair shores here for show 223, where we studied the work of Michael A. Singer, The Untethered Soul. And a big thank you to our members and to our listeners to what a journey we had. We have gone into the thorny bush and discovered that we need to remove our inner thorn. And to do so, it really starts with the forgiveness so that we can surrender to all of those thorns and make a choice because there really is a crossroads, path one of fear and path two of love and a better version of yourself. And if you do choose that path, that path of a better you, then you really can enjoy all the good things of who you truly and authentically are. You can let it all pass in order to find the best things about yourself. And that really is our mission here, to learn out loud, to do that very thing, to be the very best we can be. And I want to say thank you to all of you for being part of our growing community of members and listeners here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.